hear from guest speakers, live performances, and presentations from veterans, officers, and more. Save the date, November 8th, 9 to 1030 a.m. at the new West Bloomfield Middle School. Call 248-451-1900 to register. In the face of COVID-19, staying healthy is important. And now the same is true as we face the flu. Influenza has the potential to infect millions, putting lives and the healthcare system at risk. Fortunately, it's easy to protect yourself. The flu vaccine is safe and effective, and with COVID-19 still spreading, it's essential. To see how you can hit this virus head on, visit michigan.gov flu. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's whoop it up for these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the cheering going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. This November, honor the many people who offer their lives for our freedom at the 2022 Heroes Appreciation Breakfast. Organizations, charities, and local residents are invited to celebrate the men and women that ensure our safety and security. Hear from guest speakers, live performances, and presentations from veterans, officers, and more. Save the date, November 8th, 9 to 1030 a.m. at the new West Bloomfield Middle School. Call 248-451-1900 to register. In the face of COVID-19, staying healthy is important. And now the same is true as we face the flu. Influenza has the potential to infect millions, putting lives and the healthcare system at risk. Fortunately, it's easy to protect yourself. The flu vaccine is safe and effective, and with COVID-19 still spreading, it's essential. To see how you can hit this virus head on, visit michigan.gov flu. You're listening to your radio homes for the Megacast, 89.3 WBLD, Orchard Lake, and 88.1 WBFH, Bloomfield Hills. Today's edition of the Megacast begins now. Welcome to the Megacast, our live local daily TV, radio, and streaming show looking into all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. Today, we'll be talking to a number of people about topics of interest and importance 
Michiganders just like you. Let's begin with what's making headlines today on our website at civiccentertv.com on our local news page. Our top story comes from Kristen Jordan Seamus at the Detroit Free Press. Doctors across Michigan are urging patients to get vaccinated against the seasonal flu, expecting a surge in cases this fall and winter season. Across the nation, states such as New York, Tennessee, Georgia, Texas, as well as the District of Columbia are already experiencing significant increases in influenza cases as the season begins. Quote, with the COVID precautions, people wearing masks and socially distancing and not traveling as much, we basically had no flu at all in the first two years of the pandemic, and closed quote, said Dr. Thomas Viverka, president of the Michigan State Medical Society and a trauma and general surgeon at My Michigan Health in Midland. To predict flu activity, health ex experts often start by looking down under in the Southern Hemisphere, particularly in Australia. And already Australia is reporting its worst flu season in five years. Not a good omen for us here in the United States. Plenty of more information, though, on this, how uh, experts look into potential threats with uh, influenza, with the seasonal flu, uh, how uh, Australia and the Southern Hemisphere and their flu season plays into uh, our uh, our flu season here in the United States and in the Northern Hemisphere and uh, how precautions taken down under may impact precautions taken in your local community as well as other information on this particular season's uh, flu strain can be found in this article from Kristen Jordan Seamus of the Detroit Free Press by clicking through the article on our website, civiccentertv.com on our local news page. Also making headlines on our local news page today from Robert Snell at the Detroit News. Two more Michiganders are now facing charges for their involvement in the riots at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th of 2021. Federal prosecutors pressed charges on two St. Clair County residents for their involvement in the insurrection. One, a 67-year-old woman from Ira Township, the other is a 71-year-old man from Casco Township. Across the nation, about 885 people have been charged with crimes in connection to January 6th. These two Michiganders arrested this week were each released on $10,000 unsecured bond on Thursday and will appear in Washington, D.C. in the near future to begin their trial. Finally, making headlines today on CivicCenterTV.com's local news page from M Live's Samuel Dodge. Well, me personally, being a graduate and an alum of Michigan State University, I was hoping to see a whole lot of tears at the University of Michigan this weekend from the Ann Arbor faithful, but certainly not for this reason. Sad story out of Ann Arbor, as Ulrich's Bookstore will close its doors permanently on Monday after nearly 90 years of operations in the famed college town. In a statement, Ulrich's ownership said, quote, we want to thank all of our patrons and members of the community for all of their years of support. Uh, and with a final statement said, now go a certain color that I won't be rooting for this weekend forever. And close quote, to paraphrase the statement. Manager T uh, Tracy Buse said she could not comment as to why the institution had to close its doors permanently after 88 years of service to the Ann Arbor community. However, its parent company, Follett Corporation, said that the lease on the property expired, uh, will expire in mid-November, about November 14th, although they did not indicate that the lease expiration was a reason or the reason for the closure. So unfortunately, an end of an era in Ann Arbor as Ulrich's Bookstore after 88 years in the same location, Ann Arbor will close its doors permanently after its final day on Halloween, October 31st, 2022. All those headlines are on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page, along with links to up-to-date COVID-19 information from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the Oakland County Health Division. And as you go through to each of those COVID-19 web pages from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division, I highly encourage you also to navigate through those web pages to their flu information so you can get up-to-date information and uh, and, and and stay updated on everything you need to know about flu this season, as uh, we reported earlier on from the Kristen Jordan Chambers article in the Detroit Free Press. Experts are expecting this flu season to be significantly worse than it's been in past years, with fewer COVID precautions being taken, such as masking and, and distancing. 
uh, as well as indicators from other parts of the world, in particular Australia and other regions of the south southern hemisphere. So take a look at all those by clicking through to those links to the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division at the top of the page on civiccentertv.com's local news page. We have a great show ahead on this Friday edition of the Megacast. Coming up next, gather around, bring the, bring the kids. It's time to talk about children's reading. We'll talk to children's book author Lisa Rose about her ongoing projects as well as her other books in the past and coming up in the future up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's whoop it up for these moments. Made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the cheering going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live local daily TV, radio, and streaming show looking into all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keefe. You can join us live Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. until 11 o'clock all across the state of Michigan. Find out where we're airing in your local area and find us online, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We'll also find us on demand. If you can't join us live from 10 to 11, five days per week, you can always join us live to tape on demand, civiccentertv.com slash megacast for full episodes and individual interviews. Watch the full on the full hour or if you're interested in only certain topics and, and conversations that we have on our show five days a week, you can also enjoy at your own pace with our on-demand page as well. Joining us now on the Megacast is Lisa Rose, a children's author, and her new book uh, out now is The Singer and The Scientist, already named a National Jewish Book Award finalist. Lisa, thanks for being with us again. Thank you for having me again. Appreciate having you on. We've had you on, of course, before for uh, a few of your other books coming out. Now you got a new one, very exciting, The Singer and The Scientist. Tell, tell us a little bit about this story and what prompted you to write this particular story. The Singer and the Scientist is about how Albert Einstein and Marian Anderson met. Marian Anderson was a famous singer. She was singing in Princeton, New Jersey, and um, she was very tired at the end of the night, <laughs> and she wanted to uh, stay at a hotel. Unfortunately, at that time, African-American women were not welcome at the hotel, 
And it was a very embarrassing situation for her. Albert Einstein loved music. He almost became a musician instead of a scientist and mathematician. And he was there and he walked right up to her and said, come stay in my extra room for the night. And they formed this friendship that lasted and it lasted until his death. And um, I, I really love that, that story. And I really wanted to bring it um, to, to, to light because it was the story of how African-American people and, and Jews are, are friends and united in their, their common struggles. And you think about the times that we're in, certainly some of the really unfortunate things that have been out in the news of late that uh, that do involve that connection between the black community and the Jewish community all across the world. And, and then you tell this story of those two communities really coming together in, in this beautiful way. Now, you're, now the, the interesting thing is this is a story that is uh, written by you, uh, typically a children's author. So why is this an important story that you believe to tell kids in particular in, in this particular way? Well, I think that you have, you can't hide difficult subjects from kids and you have to find a way to tell it in an appropriate way. And, and this was a story that can demonstrate that we have much more in common, you know, much more that can unite us, that could break us apart. And especially too, as you've mentioned in recent years, um, I think the two communities have, have been more at odds. And I would like us to remember our, our roots in the, in the civil rights movement and how we banded together for equality for all. You can find more information on the book by visiting Lisa's web website at lisaroserights.com. lisaroserights.com. You can also find the singer and the scientist uh, online to order your copies on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and also from bookshop.org. Those links uh, directly to these books on those websites can also be found on Lisa's website at lisaroserights.com. And, and especially at this time where you're telling the, you know, this story and the kids are picking this up. So how did you then approach that in, in terms of writing this, particularly for kids, and telling the story that has not only a lot of really inter interesting you know, human interest elements, but also is tackling those tough subjects that often can be a little bit tough for kids to understand if they haven't you know, had that life experience yet where they've seen racism and they've seen and they've learned about segregation and they've seen you know, prejudice in action. How do you tell a story like this for kids that allows them to pick up that information and understand that that's part of the world that we live in, unfortunately. And this is a way these two individuals were able to break down those barriers and have a really beautiful relationship for a long time. Well, um, I am a teacher. <laughs> so I kind of rely on that. Now, this is a picture book, yeah. but this is a picture book that you wouldn't read to a kindergartner. You would read this, this picture book is meant, and I believe picture books are zero to a hundred. <laughs> and this is a picture book that is mostly for upper elementary kids once they've had some of the background of that. And I think it's so important, you know, through books, we can learn about others and we can learn about ourselves. And we say that, you know, books can provide mirror, mirrors, windows, and doors. And, you know, it's important to have that representation, especially if you are unfamiliar with the subject. This is a way for a parent or a teacher. This is really a book that is meant to be kind of guided with the child and used that way. Again, more information, Lisa Rose writes. Dot com. As you mentioned, she's the teacher and provides a teacher's guide for this as well on her website. You can download that. It's only it's only three pages, plenty of uh, information and, and ways that you can approach reading this book to your students and teaching your students about this subject matter can be found. LisaRoseWrites.com. Just scroll down about midway down the page and you will find her teacher's guide for the singer and the scientist, which you can also purchase by clicking on links on her website to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Bookshop.org and purchase the singer and the scientists. And in terms of giving those teachers guides for you, that, that's something that's not entirely common with authors to provide a guide for teaching and learning these lessons that are put into these stories, especially 
especially for children's author, authors. So you, ha having mentioned that you are an edu you have been an educator and and now are a writer as well, why was that important for you to provide that material to teachers so that they can use this as educational material in their classroom and have fruitful conversations with their kids and, and, and with their students to really turn this into more than just a story that they're reading during reading time? Well, I'm, I'm going to correct you. There is actually lots of books that do have teacher's guides on okay. author's website. So always when you have a book, check an author's website. They're often free. And I think it's important because teachers are busy. <laughs> they are busy. They are overwhelmed. They are stressed out. And here is something that can be easily used and applied in your classroom. It aligns all with core curriculum guidelines. So I did it because um, that way, because it is a book that requires more explanation. And I believe that picture books should not be read one. It's not a one and done. <laughs> it can be used multiple times for, for multiple themes in classrooms and um, a, way to, a way to even guide parents because it is a difficult subject matter. You know, it deals with racism and anti semitism and those are, are topics that need to be discussed. And it's important to discuss them. And sometimes as adults, we have the words, but we don't know how to explain it to children. So this gives parents a guide as well, how, how to say it in an age appropriate way. Because parents are busy and stressed out and overwhelmed too. <laughs> yeah. And especially now when we're seeing you know, some of the impacts of the pandemic uh, on parents with increased uh, parental anxiety and stresses and parental burnout, and certainly the the uh, issues we're seeing in our in our classrooms with with teachers continuing to be to be burnt out in that way and trying to you know, bridge those connections with their students and get them back engaged. This is a great way to do it to to go through a book that's tailored to children and, and to classrooms in this in this sort of way and telling a really important story at a really important time that has so many connections to our society today and the tough conversation that we as adults are having and certainly adults are having in, in the classroom with some of the older kids and you know starting those conversations early helps to really provide context to these kids and they're able to recognize that around their community and that makes for hopefully a, a better connection in those school communities and therefore in the outside world. We're joined by Lisa Rose, a children's author with us on today's edition of the Megacast. Her new book is The Singer and the Scientist, already been named a National Jewish Book Award finalist. You can learn more information as well as in info on how to purchase the book and find her, te her free teacher's guide at Lisa Rose Writes. Dot com. And in the past, Lisa, you've made plenty of appearances out in the community with your books over the pandemic. You did you did so virtually as well. Is that continuing on this time? Do you have any appearances coming up that people might want to participate in? Yes, I am participating in the Detroit Jewish Book Fair on Sunday, November 13th. So it's 11 a.m. There's a signing. There'll be plenty of other authors who are local here to, and there's authors coming in for the book fair that are, that are not. So I suggest you check it out because yes, we are finally doing in-person events. <laughs> so it is very exciting to be back in front of children doing events. And uh, it's, uh, I think this is something that we should take advantage of and, and celebrate the fact that we can all be together. Again, more information can be found as well as uh, how to inquire with Lisa about having her appear in your classroom or, or your book events can be found at lisaroserights.com. Lisa, a few more minutes with you before we'll say goodbye. Anything else you'd like to tell us about The Singer and The Scientist or other upcoming projects we should be keeping an eye out for in the near future? Okay, well, um, with the singer and the scientist, as you said, I would love to come and visit your classrooms. I have my other books as well, um, A Zombie Vacation, A Shmulek Paints the Town, and I have a chapter book series about a girl who is a, in second grade. Her name is Star Powers, and she loves science, loves space, wants to be an astronaut, and she also uses a wheelchair. And through those books, I talk about the value of inclusion 
in the story. And I really talk about, um, I call the next level of inclusion in the fact that the story is not about the disability. It is about a girl who loves science and she just happens to be using a wheelchair. And I think that's something that we we need to, there's many stories about diversity and that is the subject matter where I really want us to just talk about the person and not what makes them different because of their, their challenges. All this information as well as upcoming books and, and, and stories and appearances from Lisa can be found on her website, lisaroserights.com. Thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Again, lisaroserights.com is her website where you can also purchase The Singer and The Scientist on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, as well as bookshop.org. Those links, lisaroserights.com. We'll take a break on the Megacast. When we come back, what is going on with social media, the transition and ownership of Twitter is certainly going to have a big impact in the world that we live in, and, and that includes on the economy. We'll talk to Michael Greiner, the Assistant Professor of Management at Oakland University's School of Business Administration with our weekly market talk. Coming up next, you're watching and listening to the Megacast. This November, honor the many people who offer their lives for our freedom at the 2022 Heroes Appreciation Breakfast. Organizations, charities, and local residents are invited to celebrate the men and women that ensure our safety and security. Hear from guest speakers, live performances, and presentations from veterans, officers, and more. Save the date, November 8th, 9 to 1030 a.m. at the new West Bloomfield Middle School. Call 248-451-1900 to register. In the face of COVID-19, staying healthy is important. And now the same is true as we face the flu. Influenza has the potential to infect millions, putting lives and the healthcare system at risk. Fortunately, it's easy to protect yourself. The flu vaccine is safe and effective, and with COVID-19 still spreading, it's essential. To see how you can hit this virus head on, visit michigan.gov flu. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Let's relish these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live local daily TV, radio, and streaming show looking into all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. You can join us live Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And join us live to tape and on demand on civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find more information on all of our partnering stations across the state of Michigan and find all of our full shows and individual interviews on demand, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Each and every week, the market changes in a variety of different ways. It goes up, it goes down, it goes all over the place. And here to clear up some of the confusion and tell us where we're at is Michael Greiner, Assistant Professor of Management at Oakland University's School of Business Administration. Michael, thanks for being with us again this week. It's great to be back, Tyler. How are you today? Doing all right. How are you doing? Good, good. Glad to be here. Yeah, glad to have you with us. So uh, it finally happened. Elon Musk has purchased <laughs> Twitter. 
Uh, and that's already having some big impacts. He he made an announcement yesterday. He fired the individual that was responsible for ultimately uh, banning Donald Trump permanently from the social media website just a little bit over a year ago. And already some ripples happening there. But across the board, social media websites are having a little bit of a struggle for a variety of different reasons. What is going on with these social media sites? Yeah, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing. And 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 Elon Musk, you know, he didn't just fire one person at uh, Twitter. He fired basically the whole executive suite. Uh, and there's talk that he's going to fire as many as 75% of the current employees there, which is kind of hard to imagine how they'll keep operating with that kind of a cut. But I guess we'll see. You know, he's Elon Musk, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but uh, uh, the I think the biggest issue that you're facing right now with uh, uh, with social media has to do with, uh, well, a couple things happening. But the main one to me is that their business model is built on advertising. You know, I always ask my students, one of the things that you need to know is what business are you in? And when I ask people, what business is Google in, for example? And, uh, you know, you'll hear, oh, social or the, the social media or they're in. Uh, they're in the uh, uh, the search engine business or the website business. Uh, but the reality is they're in the advertising business. And that's true for all of the different social media sites. Uh, basically, the source of all their revenue, and it's very substantial for Google, for example, who, of course, owns YouTube, one of the uh, major social media uh, sources. Um, but it's true for Facebook. It's true for Twitter. It's true for all of them that basically the source of their revenues is advertising. It's been very lucrative for some of them. I mean, certainly it's been lucrative for Facebook and uh, as well as Google. But uh, the problem with this is, though, that uh, advertising is something that's very sensitive to changes in the economy. And as we know, businesses right now are very concerned about the direction that the economy is going. And is there going to be a recession forthcoming? And if there is, they want to look for places that they can cut down on costs. And one place that business frequently thinks they can cut down with recession coming is in advertising. So I think that's kind of the, the top line figure that you see here. But then if you look at some of the individual social media sites, it seems like some of them have some problems that are specific to them. For example, uh, Facebook, kind of its uh, main app, Facebook, you know, back when I was younger, that was kind of the new exciting thing that young people were getting involved with. Now, most of the people who use Facebook tend to be older, actually, and young people aren't engaging with Facebook the way that uh, that younger people used to back in the past. So Facebook is really concerned about its long-term prospects, and that's why it kind of shifted over to this strategy of where it's going to uh, get into the metaverse, and it changed its name to Meta from Facebook, and uh, it uh, developed a uh, virtual reality headset, I guess, which actually has gotten very good reviews. Uh, but uh, that being said, it's investing all this money in this new product that has yet to show any kind of uh, positive return. In fact, my understanding is they lost almost $4 billion on the product in the last quarter. So uh, as of now, uh, it's still yet to be seen if Facebook's going to be able to turn a profit in that and really uh, essentially shift their uh, their business model from one that really is ultimately going to be in decline, you know, because uh, no social media site lasts forever. Just ask uh, some of the ones that have disappeared in the past, you know. Um, so the uh, uh, so there's that with uh, Facebook. Then, of course, we know what's going on with Twitter. And part of the problem with Twitter, too, is it's never been able to generate the kind of revenues with its advertising the way that Facebook has. I think because people don't engage in it to the extent that uh, you see on Facebook, for example. Um, then separately, uh, one of the one of the some of the big ones that we see right now, you know, there's Snapchat and um, and uh, some of those. And those, as it turns out, are owned by Chinese companies. Um, um, which then has created some tension where we see this increasing international tension going on between the United States and China. So that kind of jeopardizes some of them. Um, and then finally, you see some of these new social media sources that kind of came in to try to address the, uh, the, the fact that Twitter was banning certain people from its website as a result of uh, uh, misinformation, essentially. And uh, as it turns out now, with Elon Musk back in charge of Twitter or in charge of Twitter now, uh, what that's going to do is allow a lot of these people to come back, which will probably doom a lot of those other companies. So point being, there's a lot of unique problems to each of the companies that are in that space right now. But overall, I think it's a reflection of really some of the weakness in the economy that we're facing right now.
And and as you mentioned that, you mentioned earlier on what you know, typically what happens when you're heading into a recession or as you go into a recession, these sorts of companies or companies across the board, one of the first things they start to cut is their advertising. And so seeing those trends in advertising going down already on social media, certainly affecting those companies, everything else we're seeing in the economy. Plenty of people are already out there asking, so where are we? Are we in a recession or are we not in, in a recession? Because there's plenty of bad news that's <laughs> suggesting we might be, but there's also some good news that's suggesting maybe that's not going to happen. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, and that's really the $64,000 question that everybody has been asking right now. Uh, I think most economists, generally speaking, agree that we're not in a recession right now. Uh, that being said, most economists also agree that we're going to be going into one, that we're kind of uh, heading in that direction. Uh, I think also the good news is most economists agree that the recession is probably going to be very mild um, and short. Uh, so that's good news. Of course, there are those who say that we're currently in a recession. There are those who say that um, that uh, the recession that we're going to go into is going to be very severe. But overall, I think that's generally the consensus that you're seeing. Now, the reason that this is an issue is because when you look at kind of the top line gross domestic product or GDP figures uh, for the last three quarters, the first two quarters of this year, we actually saw declines in GDP growth. Um, and the definition, kind of the back of the envelope definition that you see a lot of people talking about as what defines a recession is two consecutive uh, quarters of negative GDP growth, which we have. Uh, so does that indicate we have a recession? Well, you know, it sure didn't feel like a recession in a lot of ways, because by the same token, we jo jobs growth has been very strong. Uh, we've also had uh, very strong increases in wages. Um, and we've also had some very good reports from a number of companies in terms of their uh, in terms of their revenues. In fact, uh, one that I know is going to be near and dear to the hearts of a lot of people here in Michigan is we got a very good report from General Motors, um, which is, of course, something that's uh, uh, that probably makes everybody breathe a sigh of relief around here. There's that old saying that uh, when the country uh, gets a cold, we get a pneumonia here in, in Michigan. So um, that's a uh, uh, so that's definitely a concern. And the fact that GM's doing well is certainly a good sign. Uh, but you know, even within that context, you know, when we see some of these good news figures, even they are pointing to the fact that there's some rumbling within the economy that indicates we are going to go into some sort of recession uh, in the not too distant future. Some examples include, for example, um, the we received a good uh, um, profit report from uh, Amazon.com. You know, good news, right? Yay, you know, Amazon did well. And you would think that's especially good because of the fact that Amazon reflects such a wide uh, use of the economy now. You know, if you want to look at something that reflects how the economy is doing, probably look at Amazon.com. Another company that we saw that for was UPS. Again, you know, they're, if they're delivering a lot of stuff, then that's, then that's probably a sign that the economy is doing pretty well. But when you look a little bit below those figures, you see that uh, Amazon is warning that uh, basically a lot of its uh, uh, a lot of its uh, divisions are slowing in growth. One of the biggest areas of concern for it, actually, are its international division. Um, and uh, this is this reflects something that we've talked about on this show before, which is the fact that right now the dollar is very, very strong. So what that means is for people in, say, Europe or Japan or China, buying something that's American costs a lot more money to them because of the fact that the dollar is strong relative to their currency. Um, and... Uh, uh, so as a result of that, that's hurt their international operations, their domestic operations. Interestingly enough, uh, they have a big source of revenue in advertising. Well, not terribly surprising, just as we were talking about with the social media sites, their advertising has gone down. In fact, the only division that Amazon has had uh, that was profitable, and they were so profitable that they generated profit for the entire company, uh, was in their web services, where basically they do things for companies like host uh, data uh, databases and that type of thing. And uh, that did pretty well. But again, it kind of points to some weakness because it points that businesses are kind of outsourcing a lot of this stuff and trying to cut their costs out of fear that long run we could be facing a recession. Similarly with UPS, you know, good report. Yay, good news, right? Well, the problem is their good profit report was largely due to the fact that although they're shipping fewer products, their people are paying more per shipment because of inflation. Uh, so that 
seems to indicate a good news on the bottom line for UPS. But when you look at it overall, it indicates some uh, ongoing weakness. And even the good news that we got with uh, gross domestic product uh, growth uh, in this quarter that just ended, um, that one increased, I believe, by 2.6% year over year, which is a pretty good rate. And you'd say, yay, good news on that. But really, when you look again a little bit below the figures, it appears that most of that is due to the fact that imports have gone up and uh, I'm sorry, that exports have gone up and imports have gone down. Well, exports are things that are produced here in the United States, whereas imports are things produced overseas. That has to do basically with two things, again, that we've talked about here. One is the strong dollar. And the other is the shift from uh, people buying goods, many of which are manufactured overseas, to buying services, many of which are manufactured or created here. You know, people going to restaurants or travel, things like that can't be outsourced as easily. So um, when you look at it, you know, it looks like the, there's some strength in the economy. The job market is still good. We received another strong report in terms of wages going up, which is a double-edged sword when it comes to inflation. But still, I mean, in any case, there's strength there. But by the same token, it clearly indicates that there is going to be some weakness going forward. The rate increases that the Fed has been making have been taking an effect, and we probably are going to be seeing some sort of slowdown within the next six months. We're joined by Michael Greiner from Oakland University on this edition of the MegaCast. Michael, uh, lastly, a couple more minutes with you today. Uh, we, we know that the impact of student loan forgiveness could have a significant impact on uh, the economy, certainly on available dollars into the economy for uh, for, for those to, uh, for, for individuals to pay back some of their debts. And, and of course, most importantly, in, in most cases, be able to stay in their homes and afford to pay their bills. There's been some backlash, as was expected, from the student loan forgiveness program through the Biden administration, with some attempts to block it as well. But the Supreme Court intervening and providing a little bit of a win uh, recently for the Biden administration. How is that impacting student loan forgiveness? And where is that at in terms of its viability at this point? Yeah, I got to tell you, I mean, I feel a lot of sympathy for people who have student loans right now because you're feeling a lot of whiplash right now with uh, it seems like it's going to happen. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen. Every day seems like you're getting different good news or bad news in terms of it happening. The uh, uh, the administration did open up a website that allowed people to apply for the student loan uh, debt forgiveness. And anybody who hasn't done that yet, who does have student loans, should definitely go to that website. Um, but the uh, uh, already 22 million people have applied for student loan forgiveness. That's about half of the people who are eligible, is my understanding. So a very substantial number of people have already applied. The website, the website is up and operating where you can apply. That's all good news. Um, then what happened is that there were a couple of legal challenges that were launched. One was by essentially a taxpayers group based in Wisconsin, I believe, um, who uh, challenged it. And another was a group of Republican-led states, I believe six of them, that filed a lawsuit in the federal district court in St. Louis. Well, uh, last Thursday, I believe, we received good news uh, on, on two of those fronts. The lawsuit in St. Louis um, was act, was actually essentially denied uh, any kind of injunction. Basically, the uh, the local court ruled that they didn't have standing, that they didn't have a basis to file their lawsuit, um, which frankly has been my my contention since day one. And similarly. Amy Coney Barrett, uh, of course, uh, one of the appointees of the last president at, at the Supreme Court, um, ruled that the uh, that this citizens-based lawsuit from uh, from Wisconsin that th that it also did not have standing to go forward. Uh, so it seemed like you know we were we had good news. It seemed like the student loan forgiveness was going forward. Then, literally within a day, the states that had received the denial in St. Louis appealed up to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and that court issued an, a, a stay uh, of the program while it reviewed the filings. Um, so the question is, uh, what, what is the Court of Appeals going to do if they grant it? I can expect that it's going to get back up to the Supreme Court. Who knows what's going to happen there? Uh, I think that most people with student loans right now are hoping that the uh, uh, that the Court of Appeals is going to rule like the Supreme Court has and like the District Court have, that uh, that there isn't a, a basis for these uh, allegations to go forward against the student loan program. And if so, then you'll start to see the money probably being dispersed, uh, I would say, by November, uh, within, you know, within a month. Uh, if not, 
you know, who knows with the way courts operate. So I can see why everybody's kind of sitting on the edge of their seats on that. More information uh, will certainly be discussed in coming weeks as this continues to be negotiated one way or the other, deliberated on one way or the other. And as more fluctuations happen in our economy, we'll continue to go back to Michael Greiner from Oakland University each and every week. Thanks, thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Sounds great. Have a good one, Tyler. You as well. We'll take a break on the MegaCast. When we come back, we'll be joined by one of over 320 charities and nonprofits supported on the Share Detroit platform. That's up next. You're watching and listening to the MegaCast. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Let's whoop it up for these moments. Made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the cheering going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live local daily TV, radio, and streaming show looking into all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about our program, all of our partnering stations, and find us on demand on civiccentertv.com slash megacast. Joining us now on the program from one of over 325 Char Shares Detroit charities and nonprofits supported on the Shares Detroit platform is Brooke Adams, the Director of Philanthropy at Life Remodeled. As we know, uh, systemic racism has affected cities all across the, the United States in a variety of different ways, certainly on the economic front. And one of the most heavily affected cities on that front is the city of Detroit. And this is an organization working to reverse some of those effects and revitalize communities at the grassroots in the city of Detroit. So thank you very much for joining us, Brooke. Appreciate having you on today. Hi, thanks for having me. So I gave a little bit of an intro there at some mm -hmm. of, uh, of an overview of what Life Remodel does to address mm -hmm. systemic uh, systemic uh, racist, racist policies, particularly in the city of Detroit, uh, and how they impact people both economically, certainly educationally, and in terms of all the resources that are there in the community. But what are some of the uh, tactics that are undertaken by Life Remodel to address those issues on one front, but also to revitalize these communities and provide those resources right there in Detroit. Yeah, so at Life Remodel, we believe that um, Detroiters have all the talent uh, that they could ever need, but they don't have all the opportunities that they need to succeed, right? So um, we do this through, through a variety. Uh, we address this through a variety of different ways, but the main thing that we do is we renovate vacant school buildings. Um, right in the center of communities um, to then provide opportunities to those Detroiters um, who live in those neighborhoods. So, you know, it may be tricky to get downtown, midtown for some of these resources. So it's really key that we do this right in the center of a neighborhood. And so as this project, as these projects are ongoing, what are you sort of looking for in terms of those locations? And then what what is that process of you know, turning these buildings into kind of that hub, that center for a lot of these different services that have quite a lot of variety to them and may not all traditionally fit together in one specific facility. Sure. Yeah. So as you're probably aware, there are a lot of vacant buildings in the city of Detroit um, and school buildings are um, there are a lot of them. Right. And, and like I said, they're in the center of these communities and they're, they used to be these um, sort of beacons of hope. Um, for residents and for children and parents uh, who, who lived in these neighborhoods. So it's really important to us again that location. Um, so currently uh, we're in the process, well, we've already renovated the former Durfee Elementary Middle School, um, which is located right next to Central High School in Detroit. Um, we're sort of on the west-ish side of the city. Um, and um, we've renovated it, the building and we've moved in 39 different organizations. And we were really particular about who those organizations were. Um, and they're providing resources to the community in areas that the community told us that they needed because we're really, um, you know, we don't come in and give them, you know, sort of tell the, the community what they need. Um, it's really more about 
determining the needs of the community um, and then executing that um, on their behalf and in partnership with them. So the needs this community said that they needed were youth programs, um, workforce development, job training, um, and then health and wellness and human services. So we moved in 30 organizations um, and then those organizations provide uh, services to residents in this neighborhood. And we know that these sorts of services and these resources can be so important to uh, a person's upward mobility, their ability to advance mm -hmm. in their career, or, or just to be able to uh, protect their families in, mm -hmm. in their community and, and be provided some of those resources that in other communities they take for granted. So mm -hmm. as these communities are being revitalized and these resources are being provided, what are some of the immediate impacts that you see and that others see in your organization uh, in those areas surrounding these hubs that are being created by your organization? Yeah, I mean, I think we we automatically see more activity and more things happening in the community, right? So we have a school right next door, it's K through 12. So less than a thousand students there. Um, and, and those students are getting more activity after school that they wouldn't normally have, right? So, so the energy and the activity in the space, um, but then also investment and long-term investment that leads to not only sustainable, um, but equitable, um, you know, neighborhood revitalization, that's really what we're committed to doing, right? So so it's not just we move in and we, we make some changes and then we move on to our next neighborhood. Um, we really are investing in the space and we're moving in stakeholders who then invest in the space, right? So we've got the 39 tenants, but then we also have hundreds of corporate partners and tens of thousands of volunteers who, who are able to then invest in this community. And so that leads to a lot of other things, right? Um, something as simple as, you know, we're seeing the roads and the sidewalks and things, you know, those are being um, upkept. And then we've also been working, uh, you know, with the city to uh, renovate some local businesses and doing some other work like that, right? So the investments come because of the investment that we originally made in this community. More information can be found on ongoing and future projects at liferemodeled.org. Liferemodeled.org, or you can call them 313-744-3052. 313-744-3052. Three zero five two for more information. You can also find more info on sharedetroit.org or under their find a nonprofit section. Just search for life remodeled. Uh, in, in terms of volunteer opportunities, you mentioned there, there there's a heavy involvement of volunteers yeah. in making all these projects work. Yeah. Certainly in the remodeling and uh, the beautification uh, elements of things, but also to provide some of these resources directly after these projects have been undertaken. So uh, give us an overview of some of the volunteer opportunities as well as how people can get involved if they want to really help out at the grassroots in Detroit. Yeah, so our, our main volunteer opportunity that we do every year is called our six day project. Um, and that is when we mobilize uh, 6,000 volunteers over six days to clear blight in a specific Detroit neighborhood. So we just did five years of blight removal here in the Derpy community this past year, just this past month. So October 3rd through the 8th, we did our six day project in Detroit's Cooley community. So the neighborhood surrounding the former Cooley High School as we um, expect that that will be the next opportunity hub that we renovate in the, in the, cent uh, in the city. So um, so we have a 6,000 volunteers come. Anybody can come to that project. It's primarily corporate groups. So a lot, we have over 150 companies who bring corporations, but individuals, churches, civic groups, anybody can come to the six day project. Um, and it's really tough work, but it's also very fun. So we're clearing blight um, on vacant properties. We're mowing the lawns of residents. This past year, we delivered uh, thousands of mums to residents. We installed ring doorbells with a partnership with Amazon. Um, we just we do a lot of things that not only make the neighborhood safer and more beautiful, um, but you know it creates hope and it also partners together a lot of volunteers from corporate partners in the city and the suburbs brings people together um, in an environment they normally might not be working in to kind of work on that some collective impact together. It's some really interesting stats since 2014. Four schools remodeled, an investment of over 38 million dollars, 1,810 blocks beautified and all that uh, after engagement from over 72,000 volunteers. You can get involved mm -hmm. and find more information at liferemodeled.org. That is liferemodeled.org or contact them by phone to 313-744-3052. Uh, 313-744-3052. Uh, you can also send an email to info at liferemodeled. Dot org. And in terms of resources to individuals and, and families, you mentioned installing ring doorbells and, and mowing some lawns. Uh, if, if people are in need of some assistance in their homes, in these neighborhoods that you are serving, uh, how can they get access to some of these resources to, uh, to really help them out directly on top of all the things that you're doing in the community at, at large? Yeah, so if someone uh, wants 
uh, us to you know mow their lawn or, or do some of that work during our six-day project. Again, we only do that once a year, and so next year it's October second to the seventh, um, and so they can contact us at any of those you know channels that you said, email or phone call or website, Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff, right? Um, so they can contact contact us there for the project for next year. Um, but if there are you know Detroit, Detroiters or anyone who's looking for services that we provide at Durfee, they can also contact us through those mediums, and they can also just come to our building, right? We have a we have a great uh, role at our on our team called the Opportunity Navigator, um, which is a woman named Terry who you know she camps out at the front desk, and when someone walks in and says you know I, this is kind of what I need, she's their connector to all the 39 tenants and community resources and all that. So you know we're we're here in this building all the time just to. To serve in any way that we can, whether you call or you just kind of show up. Again, more information can be found on all the work being done at Life Remodeled by visiting liferemodeled.org. Liferemodeled.org. We're joined right now by uh, by Brooke Adams, the director of philanthropy at Life Remodeled. You can also find more information on the Shared Detroit's website, where you can find more info on Life Remodeled, as well as 325 additional charities and nonprofits across the Metro Detroit area. I want to give you some time too to talk about the Lean on We initiative. It's really it's really quite interesting and, and it tells a lot of a lot of stories about great people doing great work in the city mm -hmm. of Detroit as well. Yeah, so we think that nonprofits, us included, we do a good job of you know highlighting our largest donors and our corporate partners. Um, but there are so many individuals who make significant contributions to the work that we do who might not normally have their name on a donor wall or printed in the paper or be you know in a commercial or a TV interview, right? And so we really want to highlight those stories of the people who are doing the hard work and the boots on the ground and you know in the neighborhoods and who have been. Um, already making significant change in their neighborhood far before life or modeled, you know, maybe entered this community. Um, and so each year we highlight 10 individuals um, who are doing that work. Um, and we do everything from, you know, we take professional photos and we interview them and there are videos and we even work with a partnership with Outfront Media to get them all on billboards. And it's just a way to really highlight those folks um, who are doing this work and might not always get the chance to be highlighted in that way. Again, you can find more information, read all the stories about these 10 individuals uh, from the Lean on We initiative by visiting liferemodeled.org, liferemodeled.org. And then if you go there directly to liferemodeled.org slash lean uh, dash on dash we, or just click on their Lean on We initiative link at the at, uh, in the middle of their homepage, you'll find more information, including all of these stories, as well as ways to contact them and, and join in as a volunteer with all the great work that they're doing of revitalizing neighborhoods and providing critical resources that are often taken for granted in, in our communities across the Metro Detroit area. Uh, before, before we let you go, Brooke, a few more minutes left. Anything else that we uh, haven't discussed yet about Life Remodeled or other ways people can get involved and help your organization do this excellent work that it's doing for so many people in the city of Detroit? Yeah, um, you know, I, like I said, the six day project is our biggest opportunity and we start signing people up the day the six day project ends this past year, right? Because uh, organizing 6,000 volunteers is a large task. So um, we'll always take volunteers with six day project. Um, we also have a really great corporate partnership program. Um, and so in addition to, you know, the work that we do uh, at the six day project, our corporate partners are also help us with this uh, career visioning process that we do with the thousand students who are right next door to us, um, you know, helping them determine what careers are best for them um, and opening their eyes to opportunities that they may never even have realized existed just because they may not be familiar with someone who currently works in that career. Um, so, you know, those, those are some great opportunities for um, corporate social responsibility. Um, and yeah, like I said, you know, we're, we're currently, um, you know, working in the Durfee community, although we're growing and we're and looking to impact more people um, as we intend to do this all over again, because um, we've learned that this model works and hopefully um, very shortly we'll be doing this at uh, the former Cooley High School over on the west side um, of the city. Um, and then, you know, sky's the limit, right? Hopefully we can do this more and more throughout the throughout the city of Detroit and then throughout the country. More information on the work that they're doing all across the city of Detroit, as well as ways that you can get involved and help them in their efforts can be found at liferemodeled.org or sharedetroit.org, where you go into their find a nonprofit section and just simply search Life Remodeled. Brooke, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Again, one more time, liferemodeled.org or call them 313-744-3052. 313-744-3052. That will do it for this week's editions of the Megacast. I want to thank everybody that joined us today and, and all throughout the week. And you can catch all those interviews as well as our full shows from this week and all the way back 
to uh, the first episode in March of 2020 on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We will also find information on all of our partnering stations from the Metro Detroit area and across the state of Michigan as well. Civiccentertv.com slash megacast. I want to give a big thank you also, as always, to our dedicated crew, Calvin Brown and Jared Clark at the studio of My Michigan TV uh, at Master Control each and every day. And thank you as well for joining us. That's it for this week's editions of the Megacast. We'll return very soon with new episodes. This is My Michigan TV.